The OpenSSL project made an announcement on Tuesday about forthcoming OpenSSL release version 3.0.7, which is going to include patches to a critical security vulnerability that is currently present within the software. Now, this is a really big deal because OpenSSL is one of the most popular cryptographic software libraries in the world, and it's used on so many different kinds of machines, email servers, VPNs, web servers, cloud storage, pretty much anything that is running Linux under the hood, and that also includes Linux desktops. I'm also pretty sure that macOS and FreeBSD are using OpenSSL as well, so yeah. Millions of devices are currently vulnerable to this bug. In fact, critical vulnerabilities in software like OpenSSL are so serious that even though you may not have heard of the software library OpenSSL itself, you have probably heard of the last critical vulnerability that the software had called Heartbleed. This was a vulnerability in OpenSSL's implementation of the TLS Heartbeat extension, which is normally used to test and keep active secure links without the need to renegotiate the connection. But because there wasn't proper input validation on the requests that were being received by the servers, there would be a buffer overflow, which allowed people to extract random data from the memory of the server that was vulnerable to this remotely over the internet. And at the time that this bug was discovered in 2014, two thirds of the websites on the internet were vulnerable to this. XKCD has a pretty good comic explaining how it works. So our hacker here is doing the heartbeat check. They're saying server, are you still there? If so, reply potato, and they're telling them that it's six letters. So in reality, this part here that's saying, server, are you still there? This is the heartbeat request. And potato is the payload that's being sent. And this can be whatever arbitrary thing you want it to be. And the six letters, this represents the length of the payload. Uh, and also this isn't shown here, but in reality there's some padding, which is just like 16 bytes uh, or a little bit more of random data. Now, when the payload size is correct, uh, like it is here, you know, potato, and we're saying that it's six letters, then we get a normal response from the server. Uh, same thing, down here, if we say bird and it's four letters, we get a random response. But if the payload size is much bigger, so we're saying uh, 500 letters and then the actual size of the payload hat would be three letters, then instead of just discarding this nonsense request, you know, giving you an error or something like that, it's going to try to reply with data from memory because the reply that it's giving you is supposed to be as long as the length here. And that's called a buffer overflow read bug. So you can set the payload to be as high as 65,535 bytes. And the actual payload could probably be like 35 bytes, maybe smaller, but just 35 for the sake of simplicity. And then you would get 65,500 bytes of random data, uh, random data from the server's memory back from the server. And of course, this is something that can very easily be scripted. You don't have to sit here uh, crafting the special request manually yourself. You can have a script that randomizes the actual payload sizes and the payload length headers. Uh, and you would probably wanna do that so that each of the requests are unique. That way it's gonna be a whole lot harder to block those requests or uh, for the admin of the server to catch on to what you're doing. Uh, and you do this over and over again. I mean, it's a script that's running, so you've got all the time in the world uh, and you're getting that uh, 65,000 some odd bytes back at a time. So given enough time, you could eventually start getting sensitive information from the server's memory. You could get user passwords, the root password, server certificates, secret keys. Uh, you could get email contents in the case of an email server or whatever. And then of course that information, like the user's passwords and the root password, I mean, once you have that, then you basically have control over the box. Now, the Heartbleed vulnerability was fixed years ago, back in 2014, so it's been a while since we've had a really bad bug like this. But let me be clear, 
We don't actually know the full details of this open SSL bug. That's being kept on the DL until vendors, sysadmins, and developers, they can have time to patch their software. And that's typically what we do uh, with critical vulnerabilities like this. Uh, so the patch is supposed to drop on Tuesday, November the 1st, and I would expect the more responsible vendors to have their software and operating systems patched within the week. Uh, so it should just be as simple as you, the end user, running apt update or whatever, unless you're basically creating and maintaining your own operating system or your own distro uh, or something like that. Now, because it's Friday and hackers like to have fun on the weekends when the wages are trying to sleep, you might be wondering, how can we mitigate this vulnerability in the meantime right now? Well, the simplest option is to just do nothing. Wait until the patch comes out on November 1st. As far as I can tell, there's no evidence of this actually being exploited in the wild as of yet. Obviously, the researchers who found this vulnerability, they know about it, but it's unknown if any malicious hackers know about it or how skilled an attacker would need to be in order to pull it off. Uh, well, at least we know that they would have to be more skilled than script kitties because I haven't seen any easily available scripts that you can just download to perform this exploit automatically like there are for the Heartbleed exploit by now. So. I really wouldn't worry too much about this unless you are a very high value target. Uh, I don't think anyone is going to be using uh, this particular bug to hack into your MacBook or the server that runs your blog site. Uh, but if you did want to actually mitigate this critical vulnerability, I mean, it's understandable, right? You know uh, the particular version you're using is vulnerable then the best thing that you can do, ironically, is to downgrade your OpenSSL version uh, to OpenSSL version 1.1.1, uh, or you know whatever, you might have some letter trailing at the end here. Uh, and that's assuming that you're actually running a version that begins with 3.x, because uh, in OpenSSL, there's the 1.x versions, yours, uh, like I said, it might be slightly different with a different um, letter, or it might be like 1.1.0, in which case you're actually out of date. Uh, or it's gonna be like 3.x, and there's no open SSL 2.x. So here on my Arch Linux machine, I'm safe. Although I will mention that there is also a minor bug fix that's coming for open SSL 1.x on Tuesday as well, but it's not related to this critical bug with 3.x. So yeah, here on Arch, I'm safe, but here on my Ubuntu machine, you can see that I'm using OpenSSL 3.0.2. And a lot of distros that are commonly used for servers, you might remember that this is sort of my virtual machine to emulate common web servers. Uh, Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, and Fedora, they all use OpenSSL 3.x, by default. Uh, and if you're wondering what the difference is between OpenSSL uh, 3.x and 1.x, there's really nothing major for now. Like they both support, assuming you're on the latest subversion, uh, they both support the latest protocols like TLS 1.3. Um, the main differences though is 1.x isn't going to be supported after I think September 2023. So it's only got about a year of support left. Uh, for now, the main difference is that 3.x supports third-party providers for cryptographic algorithms, and it's FIPS certified, which means it adheres to a set of standards that NIST has developed for use in non-military government computer systems and uh, a lot of non-military government contractor systems as well. So obviously, those people have to use 3.x. Uh, or whatever newer version for regulatory reasons, but private organizations can use whatever they want. And as far as I can tell, there's not really any significant downsides to using the 1.x version. Alternatively, you could use a different TLS SSL library altogether. And ironically, Windows servers, which I generally don't recommend, would not be vulnerable to this bug because they are using their own proprietary cryptographic libraries. But there's a better solution than going proprietary. 
uh, because OpenBSD also uses different libraries. It uses Libre SSL by default, which is a fork of OpenSSL that was created by the OpenBSD team after the Heartbleed vulnerability happened. So Libre SSL, it is a much smaller implementation of OpenSSL, uh, mostly as a result of removing support for a lot of legacy devices. But besides that, it's considered mostly compatible with applications that would normally be using OpenSSL. Uh, it is also possible to use LibreSSL on Linux. Void Linux uh, actually used to ship with it. That's uh, kind of one of the reasons it was really popular. Uh, I'm not aware of any distros that ship with it these days though, but if you want to install it, just make sure that you test things thoroughly before pushing the changes to production. I've actually experimented with using LibreSSL on a Gentoo desktop in the past. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it is possible to use it. You just have to make sure that all of the software that you want to use on your desktop or your server actually supports it. But another way to kind of get that security, but without breaking your applications, you know, your applications that are not going to support LibreSSL would simply be to use OpenBSD as a reverse proxy. So that way you could obfuscate the IP address of the server, the vulnerable server that's actually running your web app, actually running OpenSSL. Uh, and if the bad guys don't have the IP, it's gonna be a whole lot harder for them to exploit that Linux server uh, because the only IP address that they're gonna be seeing is the one for OpenBSD, which obviously isn't gonna be vulnerable. So that's it for this video, guys. Make sure to mark your calendars for Tuesday to update OpenSSL and enjoy the rest of your weekends.